Hi guys, it's Kim here and today I am joined by two legendary staff members at Nintendo. I am joined by Mr. Mimoto and Mr. Tezuka-san. We are going to start off by playing Super Mario Maker and because I have two amazing level designers here, I thought I'd ask for some tips on how to make the best platforming level in Super Mario Maker. Do you have any tips for me in making a good platforming level? Um, so, um, actually, my role recently, because there's um, level designers, I end up checking things that are already made, so I actually want to know from Kizuka-san what his advice is and learn from him as well. <laughs> Um, but if you want to know more about kind of the traditional, maybe even 10 years ago advice, then of course I can, I'm happy to share. Of course, I'd love to know, learn from the master. I mean, you are responsible for Mario as we know it. So yeah, any advice from the top. <laughs> um, so originally there wasn't anything that was really defined. Um, it was very vague in terms of the know-how of approaching, designing a game level or course. But as I started working on these games and talking with the staff, it has become a little bit more defined and clear. And so a few years ago we actually started um, a Super Mario cram course or crash course um, internally in the company. So all the game designers were come together and Tezuka-san is the course leader. And as we did this course and as I was teaching it, um, even a new product was inspired through these courses and new Super Mario 3DS was one of them. Super Mario Maker. Um, so regarding Super Mario Makers, I do want the consumers to enjoy making the courses, so I don't want to dictate or say anything uh, too specific in how to approach creating a course, but there are a few things maybe just as reference or as an example that I'd like to share. Um, so first of all, um, one example is um, to maybe come up with an overall theme of the course. Um, for And as an example, here's a change of course. So here's the overall, you can see the course. You can see all, there's repeatedly, you'll see chain chops. And for people who are familiar with the Mario brand know that they will um, come out and jump and try to talk to you. The first thing that the player will likely do is go uh, towards the top because they're worried about falling. But actually, you can go down. Let's try and move the location of the start. And what happens here is you have two options now. You can go from the top or the bottom. There's a fork now in the fork. And I believe that rather than having one obvious route, um, giving the players uh, multiple options makes it even more fun. And with the mushroom, you can, uh, you can go up and break the block. It's not much different from the original of just starting and going from the top. So I'll add, I'll add something else now. And that's adding buzzer beetle. Let's see what happens when I shake it and place it. You can use it as a shell helmet. And then what happens here is that now that we have the helmet, if there's any attacks from above, then he will be protected. But you see here, he can't, he can't do anything now. And so as you create a course, you gradually start tweaking it and editing it and um, simulating how you want other players to play your course and evolving your course. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, we were playing Mario Maker um, in the other room and I think the danger of user-created levels is a lot of users are quite uh, sadistic in their, in their design to make it very hard. So, so yeah, I it originally suggested just having one of the um, like he does, but um, he put four, so yeah, you're definitely right. <laughs> so there is a reason though sometimes why I put so many of one character is really because I want to emphasize that character and make it stand out. And then um, in order to balance that with the difficulty level, um, you have some kind of a monitor test where you have someone else play it um, for you and see how they're doing and observe from the side how they play your course. And so by watching and observing, you see, um, are they playing it a lot? Are they enjoying it? And um, maybe based on that, you can fix a certain area, tweak, continue tweaking it. Um, if there's areas that they're really enjoying, maybe you can even emphasize that. And so one, um, another example for how to kind of enrich this course is by providing the lifts, you can have the player take Lakidu's cloud and then be able to just float off to um, the end of the course, but you make it challenging by having a lift rather than blocks. Or you can place Sierra blocks um, in a different area of the course, so you have to actually go back to the beginning or earlier part of the stage in order to find those blocks. So by doing those kind of little things, uh, it makes the course even more deep. 
I think that's one thing I've always felt with Nintendo games like Mario and most recently um, Yoshi's Woolly World is that when you create levels you always um, have it so it can be simple so maybe younger people or people who don't play games uh, can play it easily but there's always a really hard level with the rewards so like in Yoshi's Woolly World with collecting all the yarn and the flowers and things like that. Um, yeah, so is that something to consider? So having an easy level for younger or casual players and then a more harder difficulty for um, more experienced gamers? Ah, yes, thank you for noticing. That's definitely true. We do try to keep the whole process of going from the start to finish relatively simple. However, within that process or during that time between the start and finish, we try to create so many things so that a player has the option of looking and exploring and finding new ways and fun ways of doing something different. Um, so a lot of times Miyamoto-san, when he's checking course designs, he's like, isn't there anything here? And so what I try to do, even right now, if you look at this area, there's an empty area in the course. And so if there's any area that's a little bit suspicious or maybe just empty, I like to try to create something, um, a surprise, maybe a hidden item, something like that, so that there's always some hidden um, element of fun in courses. Uh, originally when we were making Super Mario, um, it was really just uh, pretty straightforward and it was more about how do we get to the goal and when we did the game design that was our mentality in terms of approach but even with that we tried to come up with different routes or different ways of reaching the goal um, however as we released the game people started to find different ways of reaching the goal outside of what we imagined. The Mario World. After Mario World and onward, the gap between the advanced players and the beginner level gamers um, became wider and wider. And so from then on, we made even more effort in trying to uh, provide uh, elements of fun in the course for the advanced gamers. So that's why you start seeing the red coins, the blue coins, and all these collection items. When I think of Nintendo games, I think it always... <sighs> I don't want to sound cheesy, but I always think of joy and happiness whenever I play Nintendo games compared to, say, PlayStation games or Xbox games, they're always more serious and grown up. But for me, whenever I talk to my friends, you know, we always talk about playing Super Mario on Game Boy or we talk about the family experience of playing Mario Kart on a Sunday morning in your pajamas. So what is it about Nintendo that joy is what you want to bring to the, to the entertainment market? Having the game in the living room also means naturally that everyone around them will see the screen. So it's not a kid all alone playing a game necessarily. And so that's why we want to be able to bring joy to the people who are just watching the screen as well. Um, so, for example, I created Star Fox Zero, and mainly it's a single uh, player shooter game, but I did include an element where one player can just be looking at the screen and looking at, at the front shooting uh, straight forward, but then you can use the gamepad and look around and it's almost like a second seat. So we're celebrating 30 years of Mario now. My first question is, what's your favorite Mario moment in the 30 years? <laughs> It's Super Mario 3 for me. I think of it fondly because actually it was a very challenging uh, project for me as uh, my first opportunity as a director. And I really struggled um, initially to try to make it better than the previous Super Marios. I got a lot of help from uh, people around and we finally uh, got it together. It was a, a really team effort and so for me it was a very memorable project. Um, so I feel like my answer changes every time I'm asked this question, but definitely the Super Mario original because it was such a memorable experience for me, obviously. But with Super Mario 64, um, that's another one because uh, it was the first time I was able to use the polygon and make a 3D environment in Mario. And so for me, it was a new challenge. It was very important um, um, project for me. Um, but from a side-scroll um, game perspective, uh, Super Mario World, because a lot of the things we had uh, previously experimented and tried, we really were able to put it together and make it cohesive. Um, also, um, in terms of the development uh, structure, we had map director, course director, level director, and all these people, uh, the roles were divided into these um, main kind of separate categories. And these people who were given that opportunity are now the creators and producers of Mario Kart and so forth. So even from a company perspective for Nintendo, is a very important project. So you mentioned there, um, you know, being with Nintendo, that you've seen people that you worked with on a junior level grow up through the company and uh, working in senior positions now. But what was it, what's it like for you seeing Mario grow up, you know, from when you created him 30 odd years ago to seeing him now as one of the most iconic characters in pop culture 
ever. I didn't originally plan it to be that way, so it is almost dreamlike. I'm extremely happy that it's happened that way. I grew, grew up as a kid writing manga, and so even during that time, I always had this reoccurring character. If I like a character, I try to uh, always have it appear, even, whether it's a side character or main character. Um, I always try to have it in my manga, that stories that I created. And so even as a video game uh, creator, I always had that in mind. I want this character to reappear somehow. Um, so that was something that I did intentionally, but um, it did evolve naturally in that the staff at Nintendo said uh, maybe this will be perfect for a um, Nintendo symbol, um, a symbolic character for the company. And so I do feel very lucky that that happened. So speaking about characters, both of you are responsible for so many new characters in Nintendo history and so many projects and games that you worked on. So out of all of those, Mario aside, who is your favorite Nintendo character that you've helped create or created? For me it's Yoshi because um, in Super Mario World it was a sub-character that Mario wrote and um, it originated because uh, Miyamoto-san had a, a drawing on his desk that he drew that um, Mario was kind of writing a horse-like character and so I knew that that was his intention eventually that I will have to come up with something like that. And so that's kind of how Yoshi came about, and that's why I really am fond of Yoshi. And, and Miyamoto was saying, well, Do you mean that I was pressure? You felt the pressure from me. And he said, No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> because of the performance issues, we couldn't include him in like the ghost worlds or the underwater world. Um, but we were able to come up with that kind of setting where Yoshi's too scared, so he can't go into the ghost castle. And, and so if we could, didn't do that and we gave up on it, I don't know if Yoshi would have even existed. Aww. <laughs> Um, and what about yourself? It does change a bit, but definitely Pikmin is kind of consistent. Um, I want it to spread even more in terms of uh, people who, who love Pikmin. Um, but for, for this year, it's definitely the fox, the falcon, the rabbit, and the frog. The star fox. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. Um, and one question I had from my viewers was, um, if you had to pick one Mario suit or power-up, that you could have in real life for the rest of your life, what would it be? I think the silver tanuki is the best. I agree. <laughs> uh, you want some Goomba shoes from Super Mario 3? I don't want it, I don't want it. So actually, that character almost got cut because we weren't able to really use it in Super Mario um, 3, but we almost sent to the Gotham that if you can come up with a few courses that you really use Goomba shoes in a good way, then we'll keep it. And he was able to come at least with one or two courses, so he definitely comes out and uh, appears a little bit. It's a little bit narrow in terms of what if it's useful. Are you okay with that option, that choice? <laughs> <laughs> so when we were making Super Mario Maker though, um, even the game designers were saying that having Mario be able to use Goomba shoes is uh, pretty popular in terms of a game feature. So from that perspective, I think it's useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta have good shoes, Batman shoes. <laughs> um, so one thing about Nintendo is um, growing up with Nintendo consoles and in the console market is Nintendo always seemed to innovate at least before everyone else so with 3D on the 3DS with handhelds certainly um, the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, all that um, and with motion controllers and you know all sorts of innovations what's next for Nintendo now that everyone's focused on VR which you guys kind of did ages ago what's next? I wish we could say <laughs> Just whisper. <laughs> um, so for Nintendo, it's always about trying to create a surprise for everyone. And so until we're ready to surprise people, we can't say. So in terms of when you, when you guys work on your projects, whatever you're working on now, I'm not going to ask, um, where do you find your inspiration from? What inspires you? Um, a lot of times, um, the previous project that I was working on, um, towards the end of the development phase, there might be ideas that come up later on, and I'm like, oh, I wish I did that with this game and so forth. I wish I tried this. And so that tends to flow into the next game and project. Um, so for me, there's a few. Um, one is definitely the evolution, development of uh, uh, the technical side of it, maybe the sensor system, um, just the hardware and how it advances. And another one is personal interests or hobbies um, that is an 
inspiration, but it's, it's something that is relatable for other people as well. What about Nintendo stock? Things like Nintendo dogs or Wii Fit that tend to be more uh, new, then it starts off with buying a dog. It's very familiar. It's something that people can understand. And when you go to a pet shop and you see people buying a lot of items or buying pets, and you think, how can I get these people who are in the pet shop to buy video games? And, <laughs> and then for me, it's, I started buying a dog too, and that was my personal hobby at the time, and I'm really into dogs. And so with the fit of DS hardware, let's create a dog-based video game. That's kind of the flow of how um, that got inspired. And that's always um, kind of circulating around my mind, have all these ideas, and when it comes together or something clicks, then that becomes a project. And if you could work on a, a game series outside of Nintendo, so maybe something on a rival platform like Uncharted or Final Fantasy, Call of Duty, anything, any title out there, what would you like to work on? <laughs> <laughs> I don't pay attention or maybe too interested in other people's projects. I don't want to um, really be too mindful of competing or comparing or having to make something different. I don't want to have to think about that too much more. Um, we try to um, pay attention to outside video games and maybe get inspiration from that performance, music, um, if we see something that really is um, doing well, then that's when I think, oh, how can we bring that to video games? How can we do that as well in the video game industry? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much both for joining me today. It's been an honor to meet you. Um, I think all of your games have influenced my childhood to who I am now. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, arigatou gozaimasu. Arigatou gozaimasu. Arigatou.